Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the third annual Aero Club Albatross Winter Seminar Series. It's wonderful to see everyone so excited to learn about the art of soaring. We have 90 pilots here of all ages, experience levels from all around the country. We have folks hailing from Alabama, Tennessee, Virginia, Vermont, Massachusetts, Massachusetts, and more. Connecticut. Connecticut. And North Carolina. Carolina. There you go. North Carolina. It's really, really amazing to see. United Kingdom. No, indeed, <laughs> indeed. South Africa. You know. Austria. Austria. Ah, there you go. So I want to take this opportunity to emphasize that this is really what Aero Club Albatross is all about. What, the rest? No, not that. Well, now that's, that's what Carl's going to talk about. We're, we're trying to avoid that. No. No, our mission, our mission is to promote soaring. And, you know, and, and our mission in promoting soaring is to avoid things like that. We do this through educational programs and coaching rated pilots as they pursue their soaring goals. The club supports members of all experience levels and aspirations. If a pilot wishes to come out on a pleasant summer day, float around for several hours and enjoy the thrill and joy of simply flying? That's wonderful. But what sets our club apart from many others is that we provide guidance and training for club members wishing to pursue cross-country flying, ridge soaring, and competition flying. I'd like to highlight some of our members' recent accomplishments. Last year, our members represented ACA in many events and competitions. Our club gliders flew in the 126 championships, at a witch clinic at Grimes, at the Mount Washington Wave Camp. Our club members represented ACA in competitions at Mifflin, Harris Hill, Wurtsboro, Massa, Moriarty, Albert Lee, and Hutchinson. On my part, I had the honor of representing the US team in Hungary, which was an absolutely fantastic experience. Flying with JP and Noah and Mike, on the junior team has been the most exciting and meaningful flying I've ever gotten to do. Incidentally, JP and I will get to race again this summer on the club class team in France in Champagne, and we are really looking forward to it and would much appreciate your support. And now I'd like to recognize specifically our members' best performances last year. Teams Steve and Philip and Jonathan and Gus earned second and third place respectively at the 126 championships. Yeah. Hey, hey, hey. Well, Richard achieved a podium finish at the 20 meter nationals. And I'd like to especially recognize Boris who had a spectacular season earning a podium finish at Harris Hill and winning the Wurtsboro competition. On other fronts, the club has been doing very well. Our tow plane has been very successful thanks to the hard work and availability of our volunteer tow pilots. Our LS3 project is nearing completion thanks to ACA's massive volunteer effort under the, under the watchful eye of Eric Mann and our, our club's refinishing expert. On the membership side, our ranks are swelling with graduates from Jersey Ridge Soaring and looking ahead, things are really exciting for ACA. Among some uh, things that are going to be going on in March, we'll be having a banquet, which you all are invited to, and the details are on the back of the program sheet. And one of the things we're going to announce today, what we're really, really excited about, is that we're going to host a little guys meet in a regional at Grimes Airport this upcoming summer. All pilots are welcome to fly locally, OLC, or in, in, the, or in, in the regional sanctioned contest. TC gliders will offer cross-country instruction. The competition days will be on July 17th to 19th and July 24th to 26th. During the week, there will be tow and winching operations available. During the weekends, we will have educational and social events. So spread the news far and wide and do plan on coming. You'll hear more about it in the next couple weeks, but you know, it's, uh, it's one of those things that um, you know, we're, we're really excited about putting this event together. Now, I could go on and on about the virtues and exciting things that ACA is up to, but admittedly, we're here to talk about ridge soaring. And our ridge is what makes Blairstown a world-class soaring site. Uh, when you 
accelerate down the treetops and feel the awesome power of the air just gripping the glider, the joy is overwhelming. You can soar all day, fly with the eagles, and go hundreds of miles if you wish. It's all at your fingertips, and it's just amazing you can even do it at all in a sailplane, let alone every week when the season kicks in. Unfortunately, last year, one of our club members, Bill Hansen, got killed while soaring our ridge. We are deeply distraught at this tragedy. Most of the presenters, uh, from the club at least, and the members of the safety committee have analyzed the information available to us and discussed the factors that may have contributed to his fate. As we reviewed the data, we talked a lot about the skill and judgment that goes into risk management in rich flying. And that is really kind of what inspired the program for today. Uh, for club members looking for a detailed debrief you know, of, the, of the accident, plan to come to the February 22nd meeting where Bill's, where his accident will be discussed more specifically. But as far as today's program, the goal is to equip pilots with the knowledge and tools to prevent this kind of accident in the future. Expert rich pilots, Carl Streetick, Richard Kellerman, Eric Mann, Jonathan Leal, Robert Cook, and Bill Farr will emphasize the many ways in which rich flying can be risky and what you need to know about weather technique, and judgment to avoid its traps. Before we get started, several points of business. Lunch will be from 12.15 till 1 o'clock. Between each presentation, there will be about a 10-15 minute break. The lectures will end at 5 o'clock, followed by a reception from 5 to 6, and everyone is invited, so please stay, enjoy, get to meet all the wonderful folks from everywhere. At 6 p.m., Folks with dinner tickets uh, will be invited to stay and to dine with us. Lastly, I want to extend our thanks to all the folks who have put this wonderful event together. Thanks to all of the volunteers from ACA, with special mention to Jonathan Leal, Paul Seyfried, and Eric Mann, who were essential for putting this all together and the program together. Thanks to Panther Valley uh, Country Club and Golf Course for hosting us. And do consider becoming their member uh, because it's a wonderful place, and as you can see, and it. Uh, well, <laughs> well, in any case, and thanks to our gracious presenters, who have come from far and wide to educate us on soaring technique. Our first presenter today is Carl Streetick. His talk, "Good Ridge Gone Bad," will overview the many ways in which things can go wrong while ridge soaring. Among Carl's accomplishments are 17 and a half, I always like the half, <laughs> na national wins. Representing the US team at 13 World Gliding Championships and being a member of the US Soaring Hall of Fame. Simply put, he is the world's foremost ridge soaring expert and we are delighted to have him kick off this year's seminar series. So let's get started. on and, and here's your clicker and you should be in good shape. Good. Thank you, Daniel. Can everybody hear okay back there in the back? Good. I want to thank Daniel also for getting this uh, organization together here because uh, it's, it's an important subject. It's, it's a social, also a, a social way to get together and Daniel's a real leader in this uh, area, I think. So thank you for doing this. Um, <laughs> Before I get started on the subject of uh, good ridges going bad, I had a couple shout outs I wanted to do. Um, I think most of you probably know by now that uh, well, we have, for the, um, the first time in 35 years, <laughs> a national. <laughs> I found out that uh, flew in the, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the World Championships in Australia, Women's Worlds, and uh, won the first practice day. And, and the first <clears throat> contest day, and was on top of the score sheet to haul the way back. And, uh, but it boiled down to the last minutes of that contest that she managed to get uh, back okay. It was a, the last day the task uh, was a, 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 a TAT, but the last, it went overcast on them all up there, and the, it, she was kind of flying with a the French. They had a real professional team, two gals there flew a lot together in France, and, 
and had a real advantage. And uh, she got a, the whole sky went overcast, and it was dead air all the way home. And she had a, a, a best L over D, a 40 mile best L over D glide. You know what that's like. I think her control stick started out as a one inch diameter uh, steel tube, and it was the size of a pencil when she got back. <laughs> <laughs> and she just managed to stall through the, the start, the uh, finish circle a little bit low, got a, a small penalty for that, but did get a good finish. And, and, uh, and then she was worried about, that was about three miles from the, from the airport where the runway was, and there was a fence, or a kangaroo fence or something in the way. And she called her crew and said, boy, I don't know if I can get over that fence or not. And, and Jason, her husband said, keep coming, it's a plastic fence. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, she did a great job for us. Um, the next one is, um, uh, has to do with the FAA Wings program. I don't know how many of you belong uh, are members of that, but it's a good program. It has both a, a flying and a knowledge part to it. And if you're a, uh, a CFI, you can renew your certific certificate on that very easily. I've done it three times now. Uh, you have to take a couple knowledge courses um, and then just send your, your ticket into the FISDO and they send you a new one back. It's really simple. Um, the uh, One of the... Um, Courses, it, there are a whole bunch, about hundreds of courses you can take on there. They're 15, 20 minutes long. One of them's called, uh, um, I think it's F, you can tell by the title of it that the FA frowns on it. It's called Low and Fast. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought, boy, that, and, and, and then they de define that as low altitude flying for thrill purposes. And I got to thinking, man, oh man, are we in trouble with the FAA here? Because. <laughs> So if you're flying up there in that ridge and you get a thrill, you could be in violation. So I think the idea is pull back in the stick a little bit and get up to where you're not thrilled anymore. <laughs> so, um, um, so that's those two things. Um, I was going to divide this up into uh, four, uh, eight different subjects, uh, turbulence, visibility, Closest to the terrain uh, we fly, you know, it's not flying thermals here, we're down close to the trees. Weakening lip, obstructions, cold temperatures, clouds, and quiz. There'll be a quiz at the end, so don't fall asleep. So one question, the final exam, you better be listening. Um, so uh, the, the first one of those, um, turbulence. I couldn't come up with, how do you take a picture of turbulence? That's the best I could do. But it, it's up and down, and uh, there's some reason, there's some, you have to be prepared for it. For, uh, that you wouldn't be necessarily in a, a, a thermal situation. Um, so uh, in, anytime you're flying the ridge, there's, there's, there will be turbulence. It varies in how much. Um, oops, I want that back there. Um, as we all know, um, <coughs> the, uh, well, at least you should know, that these gliders are designed with certain structural limits. The faster you go on the ridge, the more turbulence you get, the rougher it gets, and the more it might want to tear the wings off the glider. And the yellow line, of course, is where the glider is designed that uh, you can fly in any kind of rough air, whatever you want, or I think it's more designed for uh, the control movements. At, at the, just at the beginning of the yellow line there is where you can move that control stick anywhere in the cockpit and all the way back, all the way sideways. It's not going to break anything. And there's a there's some a leeway built into those things, 20 percent or so, and um, the uh, and of course turbulence varies. If you if, if the faster you go and the lower you go, the rougher it's going to be. So if you if it's too rough, you just pull out and fly a little higher. Um, and the structural limits of the glider are are such that. Um, I don't recommend it, but uh, I have, I'll have to admit, I've flown into that yellow range a lot. <laughs> and the reason is because the strength of the, the wings are what the weak point is. Of course, they're going to break if, if you get too much of a gust load. But you can, that, that, they're designed in LBA or whoever designed the glider for worst possible conditions. That's maximum weight of the non-lifting members. That's the fuselage with the pilot and everything else. So they, they, the, the engineers design that maximum weight and no ballast in the wings, and the spoiler's out. And they, and they has to be able to withstand some, some like 20% more than the, whatever the limit is, 5Gs or something. So in a case like this where you had a, a big long winger, um, uh, you have a much longer bending moment here, and you have a heavy fuselage. You got a motor in there, and you got two people, so it's a different situation. So I'd be a little bit uh, leery of, of, of blasting down the ridge 
in an, a motor Arcus without any water in the wings yeah. um, compared to an ASW-20 with water all the way out to the tips and so forth. You can't break that airplane that way. Now, there's another uh, situation, though, and that is flutter. Um, that's another uh, thing that the, the problem. yellow... The, the yeah. Problem. Mic microphone maybe is, is far away. It's got to be really close to your mouth. Oh, one, two, three, four, five. No? no. no. She's got a green light. Do I have it on? Take a look. Does? Yep, yeah. that works. Okay. I guess we're just not talking into it right now. Okay, sorry. Um, where was I? So, uh, uh, the uh, um, flutter. flutter, yeah, flutter. Um, you can rationalize that a little bit too if you want to, if you're careless like I am. And that, it's the flutter is worse the hotter it gets. So, uh, when they make these calculations, it, uh, it's at, you know, 100 degrees or something. We're flying down and where the glider is maybe 30 degrees, so that helps a little bit. But. Uh, I don't know what to tell you about flutter. I've never heard of it happening on any ridge flying. I also never heard of a glider breaking on a ridge. Have you ever heard of one of the wings just falling off? I never have. The problem with gliders breaking up is sometimes these long wingers uh, get upset in flight. You've heard of some of those flights where the wing drops for some reason. They get going down and they pick up speed in a hurry. They all do. And then they, they pull spoilers out or the flaps are down, yanking the stick and the wings break off. Um, so. Okay, uh, where is turbulence? Uh, it varies a lot, as you know. It depends how strong the wind is and uh, what time of day it is, but the shape of the mountain has a lot to do with it. That is, if you're flying, um, if you're flying, wait a minute, sorry. If you're flying on, uh, I don't know about this Blairstown Ridge, it doesn't have a step in it, but the uh, Jack's Mountain up at uh, Mifflin does, and so does uh, Tussie Ridge. So if you're flying up here in the top part of this ridge, there's going to be turbulence spilling off that will make it rough. Whereas if you're flying on this side of the ridge or, or there's a, a ridge with northwest winds that doesn't have a step and it's a lot smoother. And that, that ridge at uh, um, Mifflin is perfect because it, it gradually gets steeper as it goes up. It's like a half a venturi, so it's, it's, it's much smoother up here than it would be with northwest winds. Another place you might anticipate turbulence is when you're flying. This is looking at the ridge at right angles to the ridge. So you're flying, let's say, along this way from right to left, and you're looking down the street. The wind's coming in your face. There's going to be a sink on the side of the ridge because these are long helixes that blow and make these long streets. And there's, you usually don't feel this until you can't do anything about it anyway. You hit it, some sink. But then you'll hit a, a burst of up. And if I get a real strong climb going down the ridge, I usually pull back in the stick a little bit to slow up because you're going to get this sooner or later, and then, and then you hit the canopy going out the other side of it. Okay, another uh, uh, aspect that uh, has to do with how, how rough it is is water ballast. Um, that's the only picture I could find of dropping a little bit of water ballast, but uh, it makes sense to always carry it if you can. If you got a 126, you can't do anything about it, but if you... Um, if you can carry water and it's, it's a turbulent situation, it's a strong day or something, then it, it pays to have it. Use alcohol. Or just quit. One, two, one, two. You gotta push a button somewhere. Nope. You, you just see, you, you see you keep twisting it and then you just gotta talk right into it. Oh, there you right. go. Um, Another thing about water ballast is uh, you want to use, uh, do not use tail ballast if you have it in your glider. You don't want to use tail ballast. It makes the glider more stable uh, directionally up and down and right and left. And so you don't have to fight the control so much. And you're not going to be climbing that much as a percentage of the day. You don't care how good the climb rate mostly is anyway. So don't use water ballast. It will freeze up faster anyway. Um, and that's another point um, uh, uh, as far as temperature is concerned. If you uh, fly when it's below freezing, you might worry about water freezing up. It won't freeze in the wing tanks because you got those foam uh, sandwiches around it, but it will freeze the valves pretty quick. And then you can't dump it, or you might dump one and not the other. I, I'd say if you get a situation where you've frozen up your valves and you push on the lever and nothing happens, I wouldn't force it because you might just dump one wing then or something. I think you just have to consign yourself to landing with a water ballast. 
but you can put some alcohol in there too. It, I had a 55 gallon drum of that at one time and it lasts quite a few flights. It doesn't take very many gallons in these to knock it down 15 degrees or so and then it's not gonna freeze up. Um, another uh, aspect I like to talk about is uh, PIO, pile induced oscillation, because it can happen more likely on a ridge because you're bouncing up and down all the time. If you're holding the stick way up high like this, there's a higher likelihood that, that could happen. So what I do when I fly, I put both hands down on my legs and then just use my fingers on either side of the stick and control it that way and then you won't over control it. Uh, having a good harness in there is a good idea too. I had a different harness in the duo, the other brand, whatever, those silver colored ones. And that kept coming loose um, down here. These things didn't stay tight or whatever, it's, which one, I think it was this year where you cinch it down when you get in. Those, after 15 or 20 minutes, they keep coming loose in the shoulder harness. Well, so I finally took them all out and put these Schroth belts in there. And um, it's a good idea to have a fifth strap in there too, a crotch, a crotch strap. And a lot of the gliders don't come with it. I think it, unless you get an acrobatic glider or we crested it, uh, the factory do it, they won't put that strap in there naturally. But you can pull it in quite easily. This is the underside of the, of the, of the uh, uh, seat pan in the duo. And you just cut a little slot in there for the strap to go through and then glass in a rod across here. And then you can have, you have a five point harness. And that, that holds the harness down so you don't tend to crash into the canopy as much when it bumps. Need a functional piece system, otherwise you get distracted, and that's a, a mess. I know there's all kind of different theories on how to do that. Um, this is the system I use. You have a connector down here; it's a good idea. This, these, you can get these from Master Car, and this part of here goes on a catheter. It has a valve in there, so when you connect this up, it opens it up. When you disconnect it, it shuts it, so you don't make a mess. And then it, it, you should have a T on here. This goes overboard somewhere. I put it on the gear door, and uh, you don't want it flush on the belly because then it goes back and gets on the rudder cables and the rudder hinges and it makes a, a real corrosion back there. So you gotta be careful not to, if you're gonna use that, use a system either with a probe that sticks out or some other way or go in a bag or something. And then have on this system, you have a, a tube like this with shut off so that you can uh, blow it out after you use it. Otherwise it could freeze up. Or when I get on the ground, it's on my checklist also just to blow it out again to, so nothing gets in the trailer. And of course, you don't want a lot of loose items laying around in the cockpit, uh, you know, whatever, your lunch or your apple or whatever. You gotta keep that, figure out how to keep that stuff under control so it doesn't fly around. Visibility. That can be a problem, it can be dangerous. Uh, I've had a couple of dangerous incidents, uh, for that matter of fact, but it's, visibility is basically a matter of either rain showers or snow showers. In this case, it's a snow shower. Here's Daniel sent me this picture, he's flying, it's 126 I guess it is. And uh, <clears throat> with rain or snow, it's a little, uh, they're different in that they, one of them affects the performance, one doesn't. The, the snow doesn't bother your performance, it just goes over the wing, but the rain will stick on there and wreck your L over D and wreck the laminar flow. And also another aspect of rain that's dangerous is that it, it, at least for me, it gives me this visual perception that I'm going a lot faster. I don't know if you've flown in rain or not, but these droplets of rain coming back over the canopy make you look like you're going the speed of heat when you might be going 50 miles an hour and especially if you're in rain you may be uh, low on the ridge and getting near the trees and everything so be very careful if you're, if you're in rain and you're low uh, but snow is not a problem now it is a problem depending on the density of it you know, if it's like um, damn it if it's like this up in here uh, where you're trying to get, you say, well, I don't know if I want to go through that or not. If it's like down here and you can see through it, okay. Um, so you just have to, all the situations are different. And uh, uh, a lot of times these, these snow bands that come through, I don't know if you can see that or not, but it's clear, but there's, there's, there's holes in these uh, streets of snow that come through, these cloud streets. A lot of times they have snow coming out, but you, if you just wait a while, a little hole will come through that and you get through. Um, and if you, if you can see through to the other side, it's, it's, it's safe to go through snow. <clears throat> but uh, I, I had a flight with Roy McMaster about 100 years ago down the ridge. We were stuck down in 
uh, West Virginia, somewhere around Seneca Rocks, I think. And uh, <clears throat> we're waiting there. We'd given up on the fly. We're going to come back home. And I, I was tired of waiting. So I said, I'm going to see if I can get through this thing. So I, I went into the snow shower coming back. Pretty soon I could just, I couldn't even see the hardly the trees going by on the side. And I said, this is a mistake. So I did a 180 back, you know, lost sight of the ridge completely. Came back around and got out of it alive. And Roy had done the same thing. And we passed each other and never saw each other. So <laughs> was that stupid? Yes. Don't do that. Yeah, I'll go, going back to the, the idea of uh, rain getting on the airplane, if you get, if you, if you, what do I push? Did I push a button somewhere? Let me see. Well, I'll have to scream like you. Yeah. Daniel has to touch it every 58 <laughs> 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 Yeah, pay, uh, pay real close attention to your airspeed if you do have this streaming water going back over the counter. Whether it's on a rich flight or you're just going to a contest, you're flying. If you're landing, even at just an airport, and there's water coming back across that canopy, make sure you spend more time looking for that airspeed. And one other visual problem you might have, I suppose there's more than one, <coughs> is late in the day when the sun's setting, say in uh, you know, ridge season, you might have the sun down there southwest about 240 or something, and if you're flying close to the ridge, uh, I don't care how good your canopy's cleaned, it's not gonna do any good. You cannot, you can't, it really wrecks your visibility. We usually don't fly that way. We fly thermals all, and the sun sets up in the northwest. We usually don't land with the sun in our face, but in the wintertime you might, or you might be flying the ridge, and uh, it, it really cuts the visibility out. In this case, uh, over here, there's a pen dot chain link fence and a bunch of bushes and shrubs and trees. You can't see anything. And that's kind of what happens. You can't see the trees when you're going by. So get, up, get a little higher and get out when, when, if you got the wind in your face. Uh -oh. yeah. Yeah. It has to be banged every once in a while. Uh, okay. Okay, closest to terrain. Obviously, we're flying a lot closer to the train, and that's if you hit the train, it's not good. So, um, the best lift, as it turns out, of course, is about um, even with the top of the ridge and out, maybe a wingspan or two, and that's probably where the where the, the air is condensed and going and has the strongest vertical vector. That's the way you want to fly if you want to go fast. Now, if you're not in a great big hurry, you're just up there sightseeing around and getting some time, then you don't want to fly down here low, of course. I, I, that's obvious. But if you're, you're in a hurry, you're trying to set some record or something, that's where you've got to be, right down there near the top of the ridge. I recommend uh, <clears throat> when you set your pitch trim up and down, that you set it such that you always have to push on the stick a little bit. That way, if you get distracted messing around trying to find an apple or something, and you, you, you not know what you're doing, the airplane's going to tend to go up rather than down. So trim it so you have to push on the stick a little bit. And to repeat that, hold the stick down low. One hand's okay, but if you have anything to do with your left hand, put them both down there in your lap and just hold the stick that way. Uh, if you look. <coughs> If you look away from the, uh, the ridge for any length of time, it's probably obvious too, but make sure you don't look away too long, look back and make sure you're not running into something. Um, um, faster is safer in, in one respect in that um, your, your pitch is going to be a lot faster and going to do something for you when you're yanking the stick at 100 knots compared to yanking it on to 55 knots. So if you're getting close to the trees and you're starting to sink a little bit and you say, holy smokes, and the ridge is kind of flat and you should have been flying out a little bit away from the ridge and you are, you're in trouble. But if you're, if you're going 100 knots and you yanking the stick, you're going to go up, period. Okay, now, um, what I'm going to talk about now is, um, I don't have a slide for this, <clears throat> and that is... Uh, I think it's real important, it probably is important because of the reason for this 
seminar subject this time as, as not is climbing up off the ridge. Um, when you say, say you're coming to a gap or for some reason you want to climb, and so you're flying down the ridge. I got a model here somewhere. Where is it? Bigger one. All right. Say the ridge is like this, and we're flying down. We're flying down the ridge, and we want to climb because there's a gap or something. So the, you fly along to get a bump because that must that must be the thermal there somewhere. And so you pull up and, and keep going as long as you can to get to find out where the far end of that bump is, and then then turn and turn into the wind. We're going out away from the ridge now, and then roll out as much as you even flat. You want to milk as much as you can of the of the vertical air away from that ridge for as long as you can. Sometimes it'll be a street. You can go out there a minute or two and do mm -hmm. that. Get as far away from the ridge as you can, and then turn back in. And when you feel the sink coming, or it's just a little bubble or whatever, turn back in. And when you're about here, that's when you got to be looking back over your shoulder to decide whether you're going to do a figure eight or you're going to go all the way around like this. So it's either a, a, a figure eight and back to the right and around, or if, it, if you're still in lift and you're coming around and it's looking good, and then you can tighten up the turn a little bit, and you're obviously going to make it. Now, when I get around to this point, when I'm pointing right at the ridge, <coughs> I'd like to let off some pressure on the stick. I don't want to keep it back there just trying to, you know, nurse every, you know, foot per minute I can out of the climb. I just let it come down a little bit. That takes, like, if it, it gives you some more margin, <coughs> excuse me, for a, a stalled wing or something, something flip it down. So. I always come around, once I start pointing to the ridge, I just let it come down a little bit so that it's not zero G's, but something less than one G, okay? And well, you'll have more than one G, obviously, in a turn, but say it's 1.3, knock it down to 1.1 and start down and just fly around. And then when you come back out, when you're, you're obviously missing the ridge, then you can pull back up again. And then when you're into the wind, roll out, because you want to, if you keep it a, a, strict, a steady circle, you're going to drift back over the ridge, of course. I think you all know this. But roll out, uh, you know, the 15 degree back going into the wind. Then we come back around a little steeper and let down and around. Okay. Any questions so far? Anything I've talked about? I should ask a question sooner. But as far as that, okay. Uh, Carl, <clears throat> just one thing. Close to the ridge, of course, the thermals are very small. Or they can be very small, right? So you have to really uh, fly steep turns. Would yeah, I said the, the, the thermals. Way? Are close to the ridge, so you got to fly steep turns. They can be that way, yeah. You hope they they're wider, or there's a street, and you get away from it, like I just explained. But if they are, then then you just have to be careful. You, you have to turn tighter, and you may be more likely to make figure eights for a while until you get two or three hundred feet high until you make a turn. I had a, <clears throat> I was really like, I'm lucky I'm standing here because I had an incident once. I was making some, trying some flight. I don't know what the hell I was doing. I flew off the end of the ridge down at Knoxville, and I was down on the Chihuahua Ridge. And I was climbing for some reason. I, I was going across a gap or something, and I, I was in the SW20. And the early 20s are ones without winglets, or I don't know what it was, but they had a tendency to drop a wing like a standard series once in a while. And I was coming around and climbing up, and the damn wing dropped, and I went like that. And luckily, the way it came out, it was away from the ridge. I did about maybe a 180, I guess. I don't know what it did. It came out away from the ridge, and when I dished out, it didn't hit the trees. So just Expect that to happen every time you're, you're thoroughly close to a ridge. Expect that to happen and, and release the pressure a little bit coming around if you can. And, uh, and then also, if, you, if there's any question about wh whether a circle's going to work, just do a figure eight. Okay. Any questions on that? I was going to say something about wave interference. Yep. Pull it over here. See the ridges all go like so, or we're flying. Sometimes you get one, one uh, uh, reason for sink would be what we call wave interference, right? Wave suppression, I guess we call it. And the waves don't always go like this, they always line up. Some of them, they go like this, and so you get places where it's going down and, and, and it's just hard to predict. So it's, it's, 
as far as uh, wave suppression, I don't think you can, you can't really look up the cloud and say it's going to be suppression here. <laughs> it's probably not worth talking about. You just have to wait till it happens and, and hope for the best. But uh, that's one thing that can knock you off the ridges. Is there a question back here? Yeah. You stay away from the ridge that way, so your turns are all away from the ridge. Because once you get committed back into the ridge, you can't roll. It takes a while to roll these gliders, and you can't you, you can't really roll back out. So you really should make your mind up before you get parallel to the ridge, and you can come out of your turn and, and go back in and stay outside. Okay? You know what I mean by yeah. You know what I mean by figure eight. Yeah. Yeah. So you're all you're turning away from the ridge each time until you get some height and then you can go around, okay? <coughs> Obstructions, <coughs> another thing to crash into. We're pretty lucky here really uh, on these ridges that the obstructions of which are mostly towers and high tensions lines are obvious. Um, so you're not going to crash into them. One problem you can get, though, is that um, the uh, some of these are guide. This is an unguide tower, but some of them have guide wires coming down here. And so be, just give them any tower. You can't really see it till they're too close to see those wires. So just fly around them or, or go over them. And the, uh, those of you who have flown in the Alps know it's a little bit different over there. They've got all these, these farmers have their own individual cables that run way down off these high alp peaks way up there and they really get their firewood down and their milk down to all these things you really can't see them and a lot of them aren't marked so you have to be careful if you go fly in the alps be careful all the locals know where they are <coughs> okay next subject is cold that can be a problem um, by cold i guess i mean below freezing um, the balance, like I say, is the balance is probably not going to freeze, but the uh, the water, the valves, I mean, the, the, the wing uh, tanks aren't going to freeze, but the valves may, so you may have trouble getting rid of the water. Um, don't use tail ballast, uh, and uh, it, it, it'll help prevent PIO and makes it more stable and more fun to fly anyway. And another problem you get if you have a, a big glider is canopy shrinkage. If you have a an arcus or a duo discus that canopy is about three yards long and it just it shrinks at almost a half an inch or an inch so you're going to get cold air up there in the front under your on your feet and some more noise you might want to think of precautions that way now you wonder my wonder what that's in there i don't know if some of you in this room will recognize that that's the albi trophy that this guy this glider pilot in california had to idea of what some 10 or 15 years ago to fly a likeness of an albatross by glider from the Pacific to the Atlantic. And so he had this, this trophy made, this uh, statue out of brass, and it made it. It started in California about 12 years ago, I think, and it took it 10 years because people had the thing would keep it. They don't want to, you know, like, it's such a pretty trophy, they want to keep it on their mantle. But anyway, I finally made it, and uh, Eric Lambert flew it into uh, uh, Kitty Hawk about two years ago. And then the final destination was to go to the museum and uh, up in Harris Hill. So then uh, about three other people flew it up to Eagle Field. And then it happened that that was in about, I think, it, uh, uh, Sean, Shane Neetzee flew it up in, in August. It was right during the winch camp, actually. He brought this thing up in his ASW-20. And then we were doing winch, so he just winched back up and went home. He flew back home to Front Royal, <laughs> did not return with us. Thing, but he brought the trophy up, and then about three months later, it was looking good, so I called up Sarah, and uh, she said, yeah, I want to do that. She had uh, wanted to do this in the worst way when it finally, when it came through about five years earlier. There's a whole string of emails between her and, and the guy who was managing this thing, and she, she could never make her schedule work, so, uh, and it didn't get close enough to Chihaui, so she never got much, so she jumped the chance to come up, so it, it worked out perfectly. It came up about two days early. It was November. And we hopped in the duo and flew up the ridge up to Williamsport. And then you can see what we had to, to, uh, to fly with it. Not bad sky, right? <laughs> Trouble is, Williamsport's not down here. Williamsport's way over here. But uh, it, was good, it was good air. That cl those clouds are up there at 6,000 feet. And so we flew up there. And she climbed up to 6,000 feet. 
and then we were able to fly from Williamsport all the way to uh, Harris Hill, never made a single turn. And it was quite amazing into that wind, and, and uh, like I say, uh, Williamsport's over here somewhere, so we had to climb up under these streets straight ahead, then jump over and, and fly the streets again. We finally got up there without any turns. The problem was, temperature right up here at Plaza Base was zero Fahrenheit. That was cold, and we were facing away from the sun, and it was, uh, well, under the clouds a lot of the time. So by the time I got there, I was so damn cold, I could hardly get out of the airplane. And so I went into the museum there and got it. There's a Schweitzer exhibit in the front, and I ran up around that thing for about half an hour, finally trying to get warmed up. <laughs> but uh, then uh, we went home. Uh, we, we went back the same day. And so I, want, I didn't want to thermal down to Williamsport or whatever. So had Roy McMaster get the old club pony out, and he towed us up to 11,000 feet so we could just <laughs> go straight to the ridge. When we went above these clouds, it was like, again, it was zero down here. We got up there about 1,000 feet above this cloud, and it was 33 degrees warmer. It was a 30 degree amazing inversion above those clouds. And we were facing into the sun, and so all of a sudden cold coming back. That was nice. That, that whole um, <clears throat> episode with it, that uh, albatross going across the country reminded me of something from my youth. I, I remember a few things, but one of them, I don't know if you're parents or your dad ever read you Paddle to the Sea. Do you remember that book, Paddle to the Sea? Any of you? It was a story about an Indian native up in Canada It whittled up a birch bark canoe and he put it in the water in Lake Superior and it finally, you know, years later, it managed the Atlantic Ocean. It's kind of reminded me of that. How big was that trophy? Oh, it's about, about, about 12 inches high. Okay. Yeah. It cost him 3,000 bucks to have it made. We're going to have another one made, but <laughs> I didn't have it 3,000 bucks, so. Um, and then, oh, speaking of coal, I have one more anecdote that way, and that was, um, uh, what's it, what's it, what's it? yeah, I was flying this ASW-17, trying to do something one day, and it's full of water ballast, and I took off and finally gave up down around Seneca Rocks, about two hours out, turned around, came back, and I dumped my water ballast for some reason. And about five minutes later, I said, boy, this get, my, bat, my butt's getting cold. What is this? And it turned out I didn't hook my water tubes up right. And I dumped the entire 30 gallons into the cockpit of the glider. And, and my ass was about that far from, you know, zero degree air going past the fuselage. And by the time I got hold, I was really cold. I could barely get out of the glider and got down and sat by the wood burner for an hour. This thing. This is uh, this is just south of Altoona on Dunning Mountain, and uh, <clears throat> I was doing a flight in the 17. Uh, I forget when it was in the 70s there sometime, and I was coming the other way past this. This this is a mine. It was a mine at the time. And I got just about that position coming the other way, and this terrific explosion of dirt and dust and rocks are flying <laughs> every goddamn place. And I said, "Holy shit!" I tried to turn away because it was too late by then. It turned out it was an active mine, and they set off a dynamite explosion just when I got there. And they didn't use nets or anything. And uh, years later, you can almost see them here if you look at this. I, I fly by there, and there are boulders in the crotches of these trees up here from all the blasting they're doing. <laughs> Try to explain that to you in Schwanz. <laughs> yeah. It'd be combat, combat time. All right, next one's collisions. Um, <clears throat> mostly we have to worry about is birds, right? Birds and each other, basically, for collisions. This is a uh, turkey vulture. You see lots of them. It's, uh, it's it, the turkey vulture doesn't have this much white on the back. But this is a funny photograph, so I'm not sure if it's like that. But the turkey vultures are very good about getting out of your way. They, they can see you coming from behind the front, and they, you hardly ever have a, a problem crashing into them. However, um, Red-tailed hawks, or hawks in general, are a different story. I don't know if this is photoshopped or what. The red, red-winged blackbirds have no use for red-tailed hawks, but I don't know if they do that or not. But you'll be flying down the ridge. You've probably all seen it. You'll see a red-tail up there looking for a squirrel, and they get target fixation. So they're looking straight down at this squirrel, and their head's all you know, stationary, gyroscopically stabilized. They're looking down, and they, they don't see you coming. So if you fly under them, they're first, they'll see you eventually, you know, when you're 100 feet away or something, and like any 
thing in combat, they're going to die for speed, for maneuverability, so they die whether you're there or not, and they go right into you and hit you. So don't fly a, under a red tail, or any bird for that matter, don't fly under it. Uh, there's an eagle. They're pretty. Uh, they're 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 pretty uh, savvy too. Uh, they can see you coming. They generally, they're not afraid of you though. They've been, I guess, three million years of evolution. That they don't think of anything can best them in the air. So they don't really. They'll, they'll fly with you, a circle with you, and, and you can join up with them on the ridge. They fly about. That, that's another caution I'll be careful with. Um, if you see one of these eagles and you want to fly with it, you can. Although you can get overlap a wing with them, and they kind of look at you and say, "What the hell's going on here?" But um, it, you, it's easy to overshoot them because they're only going about 45 knots. That, 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 what that bird doing there is about 45 knots, and we have a hard time flying formation at 45. You run out of stick and you're spoilers, and you overshoot them. What happens? What can happen if, if you try to join up again and you're in a single seater and there's not two of you in the airplane, um, and you circle around, you tend to get it's really easy to lose these guys in a hurry. They go out of sight. And if you get down lower, you can see them better against the sky. But if you're coming around and below them, you gotta be damn careful that you have a peripheral vision and your brain is thinking about where those trees are. Because if you focus on the bird and you come around, it can fly right into the tree. So be careful that way. <clears throat> And you know the rules, if you, there's other gliders on the ridge. If you're going southwest, you, the, the, uh, if it's a northwest wind day and you're flying that side of the ridge, the northwest side, you, you pull it, the, the glider is heading southwest, pulls out and gives away. If, you're, if it's southeast winds and you're flying the other side of the ridge and the, the glider going northeast pulls out and away, right? Okay, that's, uh, that's it for collisions, clouds. Um, I'm using this picture because it, uh, you may recognize this as a, a situation down in uh, Virginia, West Virginia, Virginia, I guess it was. And the, the, uh, what was happening here, this is the Dale, Dale, the day Dale Kramer, excuse me, Dale Kramer crashed. He was coming on this ridge in this direction, like kind of from us into the screen. And then there's this uh, flank sticking out here. And the winds that day were, you probably wouldn't find these winds, at least I wouldn't. The winds are like 60 miles an hour, 60 knots, 45 gusts of 60. And this is up, this is, this is the highest part of the whole ridge all the way down to, to Kentucky, uh, to uh, Tennessee. It's about 4,500 feet up here. So you can imagine what the winds were. So he had this, the clouds are down just below the top of this flank. So he couldn't get through this little saddle. He, had, he wanted to go continue on and get down here. So he pulled out around this flank. Well, this was on the down, he was on the downwind side of this flank a little bit now. So he got out about here, and then the thing stopped flying, basically. And that's, and that's what ended up down in the trees. Fortunately, uh, he must have, I, I suspect he hit this tree on the way down, the way this thing came apart. And he didn't hit the ground that hard as it would normally, you'd think, with an impact like that. So he, he didn't uh, get killed, but he was trapped in there. And thanks to John Good, you probably all heard this story, but John Good was with him that day. And he got, he got as far as Bedford with Dale and said, to hell with this, too much snow showers. He, he's not, he, he gave up and, and turned around, went back and landed at Bedford, which is about 10 miles north. Got out of the gliders, walking into the FBO there, and he got a cell phone call. And it was Dale saying, hey, I crashed just 10 miles north or five miles north of Snowy Mountain. So John knew <coughs> right where that was, and that was, and he was lucky then because that, he, I think the closest cell phone tower was 60 miles away or something. But he got that call to John. John got the CAB going and he got down to, wait a minute, gotta go back. He got down to here and, and, and asked this guy if they could set up their re rescue headquarters in this guy's house here. And he said, yeah, sure, come on out. So, but they couldn't get him that night. And the next morning, they got some four-wheelers up here and got him and saved him. He was up there, so it was really lucky. John Good saved his life because <clears throat> the CAP, the CAP was on this thing, but they had their radio receivers and everything, and they were convinced it was in a different valley up there, so we get some echoes or something. And they wanted to search all over hell and go out somewhere else. And John finally persuaded him to go down there, and because he knew right where this feature was that Dale had described.
Okay. Um, the last obstacle I'm talking about, or last danger, is clouds. Um, in particular, you know, we talked about clouds down across the top of the mountain now and, and showers and so forth. A lot of times, if you can get up and wave, it really makes the flight a lot easier if you're going a long distance. This is down somewhere south of Cumberland, and it's going past over the knobblies. You probably know what the knobblies are. They're little Mickey Mouse, little small ridges. I've landed out a bunch of times down there trying to get through them. If you can get up and wave at Cumberland and go along like this up at 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11,000 feet, that's great. And you have plenty of uh, uh, daylight to see down to the ridge if the wave, wave quits or something. So this is the way to go. But the wave can also be a lot thicker. Um, you can have an undercast, so to speak. So you've got to be careful. It's okay to do that. But you have to have an out like this. You could go downwind to get through this hole here. Or maybe straight ahead there's a hole where you've got maybe a, a good 10 to 1 glide ratio to get down into there. Don't, don't stretch it. I was flying down there, a bunch of us were, on a, it was about 30 or 40 years ago. There was a guy by uh, Alan Sands, I think is what his name was. And he came over from uh, Ireland. He lived in Ireland, but he kept a, a Kestrel 19 down there at the glider port. And he was flying it, and about four or five of us were flying that day. And I heard this radio call down in this area. He says, he says I'm over I'm undercast, and I'm, I'm sinking down. I can't stay up. And then he went into the clouds. I don't know if he had gyros or not. We thought, uh oh, because of the clouds that day were right even with the top of the mountain down there, about 3,000 foot cloud faces. And I think he's, but about five minutes later, he came back in the radio and said, hey, it came out the bottom of the clouds, and I'm in the valley. So he landed down there. So be careful with wave, you know about that. Don't, don't get trapped up there. Um, if you ever do get in a cloud, if you try to fly instruments or something or, or whatever and you lose it, if you're not, then the thing to do, don't try to fly the airplane. If you get disoriented, you think you're in one position, you're really not. Just let go of the stick and pull the spoilers all the way out and eventually you'll come out of the bottom of that cloud in one piece. Okay, we're to where the, um, we're to the exam. So, um, the, the, the question is a one, it's a one uh, question exam to see if you've been sleeping or not. <clears throat> and the, the question is, what were the, the words out of this pilot's mouth three seconds after this picture was taken? So, okay, any questions? That's, that's all I've got. Um, I'd be glad to entertain more questions if you got them. Yeah, okay. I'll start with the first question. Uh, so, you were talking about turbulence on the ridge. Um, turbulence, yeah. And I, what I wonder, and, I, and you know, as pilots get more experience, they tend to be able to deal with the turbulence and, and kind of smooth things out. But during all your years of flying, have you ever hit the canopy hard enough that you ever you know, got hurt, or you ever heard of anyone else doing that, or have, has you ever heard of an instance where a per person got knocked out? The, the question was, I don't know if you all heard that or not, the question was, has the turbulence ever been severe enough that somebody got knocked out or injured or broke the canopy or something? I've never had that problem. I don't know if you have, um, but like I say, put a crotch strap in there and make sure your belts don't come loose. You should be okay. I, I did for a while. I, <clears throat> I wore a I had a big foam pad I used to put on top of my head when I was flying that ASW-15, because I don't think I had a crotch strap in that one, and I, I flew that way. But um, you know, and don't, of course, you don't wear it with a little, you know, hat with that little button on the top of it. You will break the canopy for sure. So you're probably going to hit the canopy uh, if you're anywhere near the thing, because um, most of these gliders are pretty tight. Yeah, John. Do you remember Lee Bernardus breaking his canopy? He said Lee Bernardus, I was on a 134, I guess, broke a canopy, I guess, in turbulence, yeah. Um, if you're flying a Schweitzer airplane, like Daniel does, uh, or they're relatively light wing loading and the wings don't bend in those things. You're flying the SW-20 or an open class ship, the wings bend a lot and they smooth things out. But if you're flying a lighter wing, uh, you're going to take, have a more, a higher chance of breaking the canopy, so you've got to make sure you're strapped in there tight. Yeah. Yeah, it can happen. Yeah, question? Hey, Carl, what's the oh. dumbest thing you've ever seen somebody do on the ridge? <laughs> you don't have to name names, but it doesn't have to be you. Must have been me. 
I took off with a tail dolly on once. Does that count? <laughs> I didn't want to land back at Eagle Field because I didn't know where I was going to end up, so I went down to the glider port. And it, when I landed, it just did one of those shopping cart numbers. You know, it kind of went around in <laughs> circles. And I didn't have any troubles. I, I, another time I flew, I didn't... I've had two incidents with control hookups, I guess you could call it dumb. I had one where I, uh, where I took off with a tail dolly on, and then another one, I had an LS6, and that had, it was LS6, the first ones, I guess they're all the same. There's one control rod for the whole trailing edge, right? The flaps and ailerons. And it's done by Braille, you know, you can't see them. And I was doing it at night, I was going to do an early morning flight, and I put a thing on, I thought on the top of the little ball, you know, the little tailgate fitting, it goes on. Moved the stick, everything was great, everything was moving. Unfortunately, or stupidly, the thing was on the hemisphere of that ball. And so I went up, got ready to take off, started the launch, went down the runway, pulled the flaps back to take off, and a wing slammed into the ground. Said, holy smokes, put the flaps back to zero. The wing came back up, put them down, hit again, hit again. I pulled it, released it, a great big ground loop. And it just turned out that those controls were not hooked up properly. Another time I was flying the 17, I think it was a 17, or maybe the 15, and I didn't have the, the speed brakes hooked up right, and one speed brake came open down at Bedford. And, you know, we go, you'd get it going over about, I think about 60, or maybe 65, and the speed, once the right speed brake would come up, I said, what the hell's going on? So I just slow, be slow, but it would slam back shut, so I just flew slow and got back home. Anybody else done some stupid stuff? <laughs> yeah. What's that? Which speed? How do you come up with what speed? The speed to fly if you're in a hurry, which we always were when we fly the ridge. It anymore, I don't, I'm not in a hurry. I fly a little higher. But the, the, if you want to, you have a fixed, if you're trying to set a world record, you've got a fixed amount of daylight, right? And you're trying to use it all up. So you start off at the crack of dawn, and then you fly in the fastest lift, which is right even with the top of the ridge, and out a little bit. And then you've got to stay there all day long. Okay, is that, did I answer your question? So, do you use your best uh, glide speed as a base and then you add? Uh, no, you just go visually where the airplane is in relation to the ridge. You don't look at the instruments. Yeah, no, the instruments don't. Yeah. Yeah, question? Yeah, just uh, Chris. I want to go back to weight suppression because I think that's one of the scariest things there is. Do you have. Um, can you share any experiences where you basically had to land very quickly and how that worked out for you? Yeah, I had a case like that. Chris asked uh, about wave suppression where you had uh, landings, that did, everything was going great, and all of a sudden there's no wind when you're on the ground. I had a case like that where I took off in the ASW-17. I was trying to set some record in November again. It was a stupid month to try a record. And it took off, flew across Bedford, or Altoona without turning. Bedford is an eight-mile gap. I said, I, I can't turn. I'll just have to go. So I went straight across that one, went down to Cumberland, and the, 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 there was no lift, it just quit. And I went straight ahead and landed. It 90 miles and never made a single turn. <laughs> but that must have been wave suppression of some sort, I suppose. I don't know, you can't see it. Because you don't know what those waves, clouds way up there mean when you're down low. It's hard to tell. But you, just, you have to go by, uh, it, if, you're, if, you're, if you've got water ballast and you're flying along the ridge and your airspeed gets down in the 70s, you better be ready to land or be cautious because the amount of vertical speed on the performance curve, you know that L over D curve, there's not much L, uh, rate of climb left or a rate of descent left between 75 and, and you know maybe 100 feet a minute. So all I have to do is miss 100 feet a minute of, of ridge lift and you're, you're down, you're landing. Whereas if you're going above 80, then you got some margin in there. Without water, uh, it's a little bit lower than that. But when you when, if you get down below, 80 or whatever, if you start to get nervous, get away from the ridge a little bit. Don't be flying up there in the, in the, where the trees are. And have some margin where if you get a, some sink, you can, you can turn away and get away from the ridge. And if, if the ridge is shallow where you are, don't fly over that because it, you can be in trouble, okay? Yeah, question. Are there any places that are more susceptible to wave suppression than others? More places like susceptible? I, I don't know, I don't know the answer to that. Do you have an answer to that? Uh, Daniel, I, I, I don't think so. Do you think so? Uh, there are two that I would yeah. bring up. Uh, one is um, Edmonds Mountain, just south of Bedford, in the lee of, uh, of you know, Buffalo and, and whatever the next one up on is, the big mountain. 
right there to the narrow little valley going past Bedford Resort. I've, I've encountered wave, wave suppression there uh, several times. Mm -hmm. And also just south of Spruce Creek <coughs> on uh, Cussey, where you cross the wires, maybe five miles south of there. Uh, I've, I've caught it there several times as well. Yeah. Those, those, the different, those, those two ridges are probably, what, a mile or two apart. So maybe that, if you get that spacing, you get a ridge that's about a mile or a mile and a half, two miles upwind of you, you might be careful in that situation, yeah. Down pat south in McConnellsburg on the Tuscarora is bad. On south of, on the Tuscarora? Yeah. So it can be, I, I think it could be anywhere except if you're, just look at your airspeed. If your airspeed, you're going along at 90, 100, and all of a sudden it's down there to 70, there's something wrong. And it's probably wave suppression or whatever. It could be between streets. You know, these streets are going up, so it's going down somewhere. So it's between streets, it's going down. So expect that as well. Yeah? So there are, <coughs> there are places where there is a lower ridge that's coming up to the main ridge. And you have to make a decision on whether you're going to go to the lower ridge, which may be joining up with the main ridge. So at, at what point do you jump from, or you go upwind to that lower ridge or that ridge that comes and joins the main ridge. So it's, it's not a step. You're talking about two ridges, two, two separate ridges, ridges? coming together. Well, that's a good point. There's so many variables that there's no easy answer. Uh, you know, it would depend on what do the fields look like to land in. You've got to keep that in mind all the time. That's also, exactly right. And if, it's, if it's the transition you want to do doesn't have any fields near it, uh -huh. you better not do it there. You better stay back and do uh -huh. some figure eights or something. There's one like that at the Altoona Blair County Airport where we go along a smaller ridge. You have to get up higher again. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, you got to keep landability in mind at all times, no matter what you're doing. Right. If you're going fast, I don't worry about what fields of land. If I'm doing 90, 100 knots, the hell with the fields. I don't even look down. But when the, when the airspeed in a water glider gets below 80, start getting nervous. Right. Yeah, Daniel. Speaking of landability, so how many times do you reckon you've ever fallen off a ridge and? and and what were the proportions to reason why? So, like, basically, how many times have you fallen off? And, and you know, uh, and of those, what, per what percentage were for what reason? Well, it's sometimes it's because uh, the ridge turns. You know, that can happen. It, it, you're, you're, you, what you want to do is, of course, is the maximum vertical component to the air is what you want to be flying in. Well, that, that's... Perfect. I mean, it's not perfect, but it's best when the, when the wind's at right angles. And then, but it can't be at right angles all the time because these ridges turn all over the place. There's a big major turn in the Appalachians uh, between the Altoona and Shippensburg line. There, you know, it turns about 20, 30 degrees. So you're going to get a change there. So it depends, you know, how the ridge goes. But I can't, I can't give you a, a firm answer to that. You know. Yeah. Do you make radio calls to let other drivers know that you are on a ridge or something? He's, the question is, do I make radio calls? No, I don't make radio calls. Um, we usually go, if, there's a, if it's a busy day and there's a lot of chatters, you usually get, sometimes you get some guys that just like to yak. <laughs> and it drives me crazy, so we go to another frequency, a, a special frequency, or turn the radio off. Okay, that's it. Thanks a lot.